Good afternoon. Thank you very, very much for coming. This is an event we've looked forward to here at the Kennedy School now for some time. And I think that uh, in just a few moments you'll have ample reason to find out why uh, this has been uh, such an uh, unanticipated uh, uh, day. Uh, this is an event that is uh, co-sponsored by three uh, organizations here. Uh, the HKS uh, National Security Committee, what is that What is that called? The Armed Forces Committee, is that what that's called? Okay, well, that's a, made up, the veterans make that up, and then the National Security Fellows, uh, and then our own Center for Public Leadership. And I guess we provided the pizza. Did we do, do that, Donna? Uh, and uh, also, we're, we're just, we were honored that, uh, that our speaker was able to come. Uh, I had the uh, pleasure, my wife and I, this summer, of uh, going with our speaker and his new bride uh, to the Boston Red Sox game where he was honored. He was veteran of the month, he was a veteran of the month. And, it, uh, and they asked him to come over and stand up on top of the uh, Red Sox dugout in between innings. And he got this thunderous, thunderous applause. The whole stadium stood, you know, it was a sold out game. Uh, and I think it, sh it, it demonstrates the sentiments of this country towards so many young heroes who've come back uh, from serving the country in military uniform and are increasingly providing role models here in the United States and overseas uh, for, le for citizen leadership and trying to uh, get others engaged in, in leadership. Eric Greitens uh, grew up in Missouri. Uh, he went to Duke, uh, where I'm proud to see the uh, Duke tie uh, that he has on today, a uh, Blue Devil look looking tie. Uh, he was a philosophy major in, in college. Uh, he won both a, um, uh, a Rhodes Scholarship and it was a Marshall? Truman. Truman, and a Truman. It's, not, it's, it's a rare individual who wins both of those. Went off to Oxford, uh, where he did two things. It's an interesting question, which one was more notable? Uh, he got a PhD in international development, and he also won a number of boxing championships um, because he'd become an amateur boxer while he was at Duke, found that it was a little cushy uh, there, and had went off to these, uh, these gyms in Durham uh, where I grew up and, uh, and, and, and worked out with these black boxers and who taught him how to box. But he went off to Oxford and did that, and he became a humanitarian. Uh, working in far-flung places in the world like Rwanda and other places like that. Uh, and one might think that that would have put him firmly on a path uh, to be engaged in, as an academic perhaps, uh, who is, uh, might, might be here at the Carr Center uh, working on human rights. But instead he decided to make a different life choice. In 2003 he signed up for the Navy SEALs. And those of you who know anything about the SEALs know just how tough a regime that is. We've all learned more about that with the, uh, uh, the demise of uh, bin Laden. Uh, and while there, he had four deployments. Uh, he won a number of um, uh, awards for his military service, including a Purple Heart. But as I understand, the as I remember the story, I may have some aspects of this wrong. Uh, while he was wounded, it was his, uh, it was his, uh, his men in uniform who were more grievously wounded. He came back and saw how their lives had been uh, changed so dramatically. Uh, by their disablement, and, the, and so many of them were demoralized because they had joined the service in a, with a sense that, that they were on a mission, a mission to serve the country. And that mission had been brought to a crashing end uh, by what, what had happened to them uh, in the field. And Eric then set out to see if he couldn't provide new hope uh, for them and get them back on their feet. And he started an organization called The Mission Continues. And the whole notion behind the mission continues is, okay guys, you've been disabled in one way, but you're still able in other ways. It's really important for us to help you get back on your feet, find jobs where you can continue to serve your country. Uh, and he can tell more about that story. But the first call I got about Eric uh, came from the president of the Goldman Sachs Foundation some months ago and said, I'd like to introduce you. You need to know about Eric Greitens. I said, I've heard about him. I know about him already, but tell me more. And she said, we have fallen in love with him at the Goldman Sachs Foundation. And the, and the foundation has provided him $6 million for his startup. Um, and he's now got, I think, three more years of, uh, to, to spend out and to build this organization and to partner with other veterans organizations on behalf of, uh, of veterans around the country. Um, it's a stirring 
uh, tale. It's a personal story as well as a story about the idealism of the country. And he captured it best, and I hope that you will have a chance. Um, you know, we, we don't, under the rules, we don't sell books at, at Harvard. It's sort of a difficult thing to do, but we can urge you to get, to go and get this book. But his book called The Heart and the Fist um, is, I think, and it's called, it's, the subtitle is The Education of a Humanitarian, The Making of a Navy Seal. Uh, and I just would urge you to read this. I, I, he sent it to me in a manuscript form, and I wrote on the, on, the, uh, on the among the endorsements. If you worry that America is no longer a home of heroes, come read this riveting tale of a young man's adventures as a boxer, a thinker, a warrior, and ultimately a humanitarian. He writes admiringly of the Greek notion of phronesis, phronesis, practical wisdom, quote, the ability to figure out what to do while at the same time knowing what is worth doing. Mr. Greitens has plenty of phronesis. Uh, so I want to turn this over, but just before I do that, you have to meet his bride. Could you, could you please stand just for a moment? Uh, Mary, now how many, eight weeks is it now? Eight weeks, 10 weeks? Maybe 10. Yeah, yeah. Ten weeks, ten <laughs> weeks. And you know where they met? They met at the Institute of Politics. Uh -huh. he, uh, uh, Eric was here on a panel, uh, and she was studying as a PhD student in the government department, yeah. and came uh, just almost randomly. A friend asked her if she'd come, and she wasn't quite sure, and then her day opened up, and she said, I think I'll come. Uh. And the rest is history. Uh, and they went off and had a wonderful honeymoon in Italy. Uh, they're now back living in, 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 in uh, St. Louis. Uh, one day we'd like to see them living in Cambridge again. You've got to finish that. She, she's, she's finished all her courses now. She's got to get her thesis done. But I'm telling you, uh, I think that she tells that the fact that they're married tells you everything you need to know about him. <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn this over to you all. Uh, we've got our student leader here to do this. Thank you very much. Eric, thank you very much for being here. Oh, thank you, David. So, welcome. Uh, my name, I don't know if this thing is too loud here. Uh, my name is Dan Futrell. Uh, I am a second year uh, public policy student here. Um, I am a five year uh, Army veteran uh, and uh, left uh, immediately after the Army uh, to come here to school. Very excited to be here uh, co moderating uh, with Renee. How you guys doing? My name is Renee Ramsey. Um, I'm also a student here at the Kennedy School in the Master's Public Policy Program. Um, I'm an Army veteran. I'm eight years in, uh, but I still am on active duty. I'll be uh, traveling to West Point on completion of my studies to teach international relations in the uh, social sciences department. So, uh, Eric, I'd like to uh, start you off. Um, <clears throat> You have, you know, right now as uh, leading the mission continues, you have dedicated yourself to service. Um, and particularly you've chosen, you know, how do we get uh, veterans coming home to continue their life of service uh, in the country? Yeah. Uh, you, didn't, you didn't start out there. Uh, that, that has been a life journey. And I'm curious if you could share kind of uh, briefly kind of the, the, the big points, uh, the big experiences that you had that, that got you to where you are now. Sure. Uh, yeah, just, um I, I was very fortunate, actually, when I was young, to have a number of really important mentors who pushed me. Um, and one of those was a guy when I was 16 years old. His name was Bruce Carl. Uh, Bruce Carl ran this thing in St. Louis called the Youth, uh, Youth Leadership St. Louis Program. And Bruce said to me one day, he said, Eric, I want you to come down and we're going to do some service work in a homeless shelter in downtown St. Louis. And I had done different community service projects before, and uh, but I. I I said, yeah, sure, I'll be happy to go down with you, Bruce. And, and then Bruce said to me, and we're going to spend the night in the homeless shelter. And as a 16-year-old kid, that was a little bit you know, fear-inducing to have to actually think about spending a night in a homeless shelter. Uh, what Bruce did for me, though, and he did for all of the students who were in his program, was that he always addressed us with real respect. We were 16 years old, we were teenagers, but what Bruce said to each one of us was, he said, I want you to come down and I want you to spend the night in the homeless shelter because I want you to understand how all of your neighbors are living. And he said, and I want you to understand that because you can do something about it. And as a 16-year-old kid, you don't feel like you can actually do something about homelessness. But Bruce said to us, he said, you can actually do something about this. And he didn't say, you know, you have to wait until you're 26 or 36 or 46 to do this. He said, you can do this when you're 16 years old. 
And I was really fortunate to have mentors like that when I was young uh, who pushed me um, and, and taught me different ways that I could connect to different people and different ways that I could be of service. And then I was very fortunate uh, when I did, when I went to Duke, I had some great professors who, again, who pushed me, who ha had me do my first international humanitarian work. Um, took me when I was 20 years old to live in a refugee camp uh, with Bosnian refugees who were survivors of the ethnic cleansing. Uh, I was fortunate as a, as a Navy SEAL, again, uh, to have some great instructors who really pushed me and pushed you past your physical, mental, and, and emotional limits. Um, and so so I think I've been fortunate in all of those cases to have people who really helped to push me in my own journey and push me in a very particular way and to push me to see how I could actually be of service to others. And it's, it's a way that a lot of times we're not pushed, right? I mean, we might be pushed academically, we might be pushed physically, but I, I was really fortunate to have a lot of people who pushed me to see how I could be of service to others. And um, as David mentioned, it was after the experience in Iraq when our team was hit by the suicide truck bomb, when I came home, and I visited with my friends and I visited with wounded Marines at Bethesda Naval Hospital that led me uh, to the work that we do today with the mission continues. It's kind of a follow up to that. Um, yeah. You mentioned in your book uh, when you first arrived at Duke as an undergraduate, yes. um, you were perhaps a little disillusioned yes. um, with, the, <laughs> with, with the education, the formal education of public policy. So was there any event um, or, or was a series of things that kind of led you to embrace uh, the formal study and then continue your humanitarian work? Yeah. Well, I think first of all, you know, and it was interesting actually, if anybody who's read the book, I, I talk about my disillusionment when in my first class of the first day of my freshman year, when I was in a public policy studies class and the professor started writing a decision matrix up on the, on the board and he was putting little multiplication pieces on there. And I just, you know, I was so excited about everything that we were gonna learn at college and all of the wisdom that was gonna be handed down to us. And then when I saw the multiplication table, my, my heart just sank. And I just thought, is this, is this what, we're, what we're gonna take? And, and so I, I think that, you know, part of what happened, and the story is that recently, the professor who taught that class wrote to me. Right? And, and, and he, actually, he actually said to me, he said, oh, I, you know, I, I, I read this and I was, you know, I'm sorry that I didn't engage you in the right way. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I said, actually, I mean, I, I was, you know, I was 18 years old and I had all of these grand ideas about what was going to happen. I probably would have been disillusioned with anything that I would have, would have seen on that, on that first day. But I think that for me, uh, what happened at Duke that was really important for me was um, first I had some really great mentors and so very early in my freshman year I started to think about what I wanted to study and I actually went to a couple of mentors and I asked them who are all of the people who I should take a class with while I'm at Duke Right? Regardless of subject area, like who do you need to take a class with? And somebody said, like, you got to take a class on Milton with Reynolds Price. And you got to take a class on Renaissance history with Ron Witt. And you got to take a class on religion and ethics with Tom McCullough. And they just, you know, they were able to put me uh, and point me to some really incredible individual professors, regardless of, of subject area. So I think part of it was having those good mentors who connected me to some, some professors who, uh, who would, who kind of helped to, to guide me. Then I think the other thing that helped to round out my education was also what I was doing outside of the classroom. I was having these wonderful experiences in the classroom and then I would leave Duke every afternoon and I would drive down to the inner city in Durham, North Carolina and I'd go to this boxing gym in the city. And it was really fun to leave uh, the Duke philosophy classroom where somebody would be teaching about Aristotle, right? And Aristotle says that you know what the good thing is by seeing what the good man does. And then I would drive down a couple of miles into the city and I'd be with my boxing coach and I'd be asking him all these questions about how to throw a jab and how to throw a hook and how to throw an uppercut. And he'd always say to me just, he'd say, watch Derek. He'd say, watch your training partner. They watched Derek, and I'd say, yeah, 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 but how do I, mean, how do I, and I had all these questions, and he, all he would say to me all the time, he said, watch Derek. He said, do as he does. And so I started to see after a while like, that what I was actually learning in the classroom was actually reflected here in this very different environment in, in the boxing gym. And being able to have all of that come together combined with the service work overseas really, I think, provided a really rich education. Yeah. 
So basically what you're saying is in order to serve, we need to go get our face beat in, right? <laughs> <laughs> you have to avoid that, actually. You've got to find the right, the right teacher. Yes, yes. <laughs> you, uh, you said something that was, that was, I thought was interesting as we were talking ahead of this. Yeah. And uh, you, you kind of made a connection. And you called it yeah. success to... What do you call it? Significance. Success to significance. And, and that was, you know, that's something I've been, I've been kind of thinking about as I was thinking about this discussion. Um, and uh, the way that, that you kind of framed it and the way that I was kind of, you, you know, you were kind of talking about, all right, you know, uh, there are so many very talented people who are at a point in their lives where they have been successful. Uh, how, do you, how do you kind of convert that into making a real difference, into significance? And a, a, as I've been, you know, I, I was thinking about it ahead of time and thinking about, you know, kind of there is the, you know, in the military, they, they kind of refer to it as a tactical level versus a strategic level. Um, here, I mean, we would just say, you know, on the ground, you know, getting your hands dirty versus uh, making policy. And, you know, as, as, I, as I'm trying to imagine these two worlds coming together, um, that's 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 where you are. You have been, you know, you have served in the in the White House, uh, and you've been in Rwanda, uh, and you've served in, in Afghanistan. How do you, you know, there is, uh, and I know that you've you've seen some of this where uh, a well-intentioned policy has come down and has been not exactly ideal when it got to the bottom. Uh, how do you how do you marry those two communities in a way? How, how do they interact? in a way that gets the, the, the most bang for the buck and it, it is effective uh, yeah. for the people we're trying to serve? So I, I, it's a really, really important question, right, about how we actually turn you know, well thought through policy into effective practice on, on the ground. So first, I'll give you a really boring answer. Right? I think boring answers are always good to, to get, out, get out there because we, we find how common they are. Right? So the really boring answer that people always offer when you think about you know, what's, how come this great policy isn't actually being implemented on the ground? Or how come the people who are creating policy don't understand what's actually happening on the ground? And it's always presented as an information problem. Right? So the suggestion is always, well, only if the people who are creating policy, if they just really understood all of everything that was happening on the ground, then they would create different policies. Right? And there's a suggestion that somehow there's an information disconnect there. And sometimes that can happen. Sometimes it's true that there's an information disconnect between the people who are creating policy and the people who are implementing the practice on the ground. Um, actually, I think that there are a lot of other things that usually go wrong in that translation from policy to practice. Uh, one of them is that a lot of times people who are creating policy at, a, at, a, at any level, it could be mid operational level, strategic level, don't have a clearly articulated view of what success is. And that clearly articulated view of what success is is not actually shared all the way down. And sometimes they don't know what, that, what success is because they're not sure themselves. They haven't actually figured out what they're trying to accomplish. And then what ends up happening on the ground is that you get a mess. Right? And you have people moving in all of these different directions because there's, from the leadership, there's no really clear sense for where you actually need to go. Second thing that can happen um, in that divergence between policy and practice is that you actually have a lot of interests. And this is true in a military situation. It's true in humanitarian work. It's true in any number of environments. A number of interests that are involved in the actual practice that may not accord with what's set out by policymakers. So I'll give you a really specific example. We know in almost every international humanitarian situation that it's almost always better for children in desperate situations to stay with their parents and with their caretakers. And yet we find time and time again in all of these different emergencies that children end up being isolated from their caretakers and they're put in orphanages or they're put in unaccompanied children's centers. And you ask yourself, well, why does that happen? Well, part of why it happens is because it's much easier if you're actually controlling children in a center, it's much easier to bring the media to actually show them the programming that you're doing as a nonprofit organization versus working with a bunch of distributed families throughout a refugee camp. It's much easier to do fundraising when you have everyone collected together. It's much easier if you have a new programmatic idea that you want to implement and you have a settled population there in an unaccompanied children's center, it's much easier to try that new programming out. So there are a lot of reasons that, you know, because of fundraising interests, the interests of volunteers, the interests of media, that actually drive practice on the ground in a way that can actually help it to, that means that it, it diverges from, from policy. 
And then the, the final thing that I think is really important for all of us who are in this room to think about is that there's a really important difference between knowing that and knowing how. Okay? And if you were going to take a philosophical view of this, Aristotle talks about two different kinds of wisdom. Right? And he talks about Sophia and he talks about phronesis. And Sophia is a knowledge of systems. Right? So if you think about your knowledge of biology or astronomy or physics, it's a knowledge of systems. Right? Phronesis is a, is a practical wisdom that involves knowing how to get things done while at the same time knowing what is worth doing. And a lot of times at a policy level, you have people who have a tremendous education in knowing that. And they've studied systems, and they've studied history, and they've studied practice, but they may not have had actual understanding of how to get things done on the ground. Right. One of the things that you recognize in a refugee camp or working with street children in Bolivia that you know, one of the impediments to actually implementing an education policy might be that someone's parent is an alcoholic. Right? That's actually the really important barrier to their education and you know that because you're actually on the ground. Whatever policy is set out uh, around that has to uh, face those practical barriers that people uh, are facing who are involved in the how, who are involved in the implementation. And one of the things that can happen is that sometimes when we know that, we set out policies in such a way and create restrictions and barriers that don't enable the people who are actually doing the how to do that, uh, to actually um, implement their, their practices effectively. Right? So one of the things that you found that I write about in the book was around force protection in the US military. Right? So there's this policy, you want to keep everybody, you, wanna, you know, force protection, protect your troops, protect your troops. Well, what that, what that leads to for us in Kenya was a bunch of guys in uh, you know, Land Rovers with sunglasses on, wearing you know, uh, M4s in, their, in our laps, zipping through these villages. Right? High speed. And that was great for force protection because it meant that we weren't going to get ambushed. It meant nobody was going to shoot at us. Right? And in the immediate term, it kept us safer. What it also did is it upset all of the villagers around us because we'd go flying through these villages where they had young kids. And well, when, you, when, when you kind of have that divergence between people who are thinking about systems and people who are thinking about the practical reality of how things need to get done, that's also where you can get um, a lot of the disconnects between policy and, and practice, which is why it's so important, I think, to have policymakers who have that really tough, callous hands, hard work experience of doing things on the ground so that can inform the way that they actually create policy. Thank you. Sure. Question regarding leadership. Do yes. You have a kind of vast experience at the yes. tactical level sure. and strategic. Yeah. Um, it's been remarked that most of our world and nation's citizens that are the most successful, yeah. um, they have resilience and, and strength of character as pro probably their core asset as opposed yeah. to um, other things. So um, as well as that strength of character and that resilience comes through uh, failure. It comes yes. through trial and error by experiencing things uh, that, that you don't often succeed at, yes. dusting yourself off and getting back up. As someone who appears to have succeeded at everything he's tried, um, <laughs> how do you... Um, what failures have yes. you gone through that have developed your resilience and your strength of character? So there's a, a, a tremendous string of failures, and we can talk about them all afternoon. I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you just a few. So uh, the first day that I walked into a box in Durham, North Carolina, I had no idea what I was doing. And I walked in, and I went to a corner, and I set my stuff, stuff down, and I started doing some push-ups, and I started doing some sit-ups. I had no idea how to train myself as a boxer. And this guy walks over to me, and he says, hey, man, you want to spar? And I, I didn't have to think about that for long. And I said, no. <laughs> and, 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 and then he says to me, he says, hey, man, how are you going to learn how to box if you don't spar? And I had no answer for him, so I walked into the equipment closet and I put on a headgear and we got into the ring and he beat me up. Right? And it wasn't a vicious beating, which would have been bad but might have even been acceptable. It was actually kind of one of those comic pathetic beatings. <laughs> like, I'm going to let you stay here and I'm going to move around and I'm going to smile at you while I'm hitting you and I'm just going to really reinforce this notion that you don't know what you're doing here and that you don't deserve to be here and that this isn't your place. I remember as I was driving home that night, you know, I was 
driving back to the campus and I was just thinking, I was like, what am I doing? Right? You know, what, what am I doing? And I knew, you know, there were all of the reasons why I knew intellectually that I wanted to, to box and I wanted to test myself in this way. But what I took from that was that I needed to, I needed to go back um, and I did, and I, and I went back the next day, and I found myself a place in uh, the gym, and I started to work out again. And when the guy came back up again, and he said, hey man, you wanna spar? I said, I said to him, I said, yes. I said, I do when I'm ready, you know? And, and uh, what I ended up finding at Duke, especially at, in the boxing gym, was that it was impossible for me to train myself. It was impossible for me to train myself through that failure. And it was possible for me to train myself through that pain. And what I needed to have was I needed to have the right kinds of friends and mentors. And I was very fortunate to ultimately find uh, my boxing coach, Earl Blair, and my training partner, Derek Humphrey, who was a professional fighter, who actually helped me to actually, you know, become a, a decent amateur boxer. I was never great, but I became, I became, I became a decent amateur boxer. And, and it was those, those friends who helped me through that period. And you know, I've, I've had so many different uh, failures in, in my life, but when I look back on, on all of them, one of the things that I am able to see at every place was that as I was going through those moments of pain and fear and confusion and, and chaos, that often what I had with me was I had the right friend. Right? And I had friends who were there who cared enough about me that they were willing to help to push me through pain. Right? And a lot of times when we think about our friends, we think about people who, you know, who we turn to for comfort right? when, we're, when we're in a tough spot. And actually what these friends did for me in all of these situations was that they cared enough about me that they were actually willing to push me through pain. And that's, it's one of the lessons that we use today in the work that we're doing with wounded and disabled veterans. Um, what we find is that of course when they are having to physically rehabilitate, emotionally rehabilitate. They often have social problems that are happening in, in their lives and they've got family problems and difficulties and there's often a lot of failure as they're moving towards this idea of rebuilding purpose in their life. And what I know is that if we really care about them and we, re and we, we really care about them getting to this place where they can serve as a citizen leader again, we have to be willing to push them through that pain. Because a lot of times what the culture will do is the culture will say, oh, you were hurt, you were injured, uh, you lost a limb, you've got post-traumatic stress disorder, hey, we're going to send you some free baseball tickets. We're going to send you free movie tickets. We're going to send you a gift basket. We're going to send you a blanket. And we're trying to give them all of these things as if that's going to make up for this sense of purpose that they've lost. And so I think for me, when I think about all of the failures that I've experienced in my life, I've been so fortunate to have the right kinds of people who pushed me. I'll give you just one more you know, small example on that. Um, I remember uh, one of my great philosophy professors at Duke was a guy named Alistair McIntyre. Um, great professor. And I remember I turned, in, uh, a, <laughs> I turned in a paper on Kant or something. And, and he gave us a very simple assignment. And the assignment was to write Kant's argument. And, and, and you know, the, the idea was you were supposed to, you, well, it might be that simple, but, but anyway, but, but the idea was you were, you were supposed to write down exactly what Kant said. And I started out by writing, you know, Immanuel Kant was born in Kona Marino, right? And he gave me the paperback, and there was just a giant X through like the first four paragraphs. And he said, this is not what I asked for. And what he said was, you need to learn how to actually understand someone else's argument before you start adding your own commentary. And if you, if you don't do that, you'll never actually be able to have your own thoughts. You have to be able to digest what somebody else is thinking. And again, it was a professor who, at that moment, you get those giant X's on your, <laughs> on your paper, and you start to think, oh man, I thought this, right? But this was somebody who actually cared enough about the discipline and cared enough about me and all of his students that he was actually willing to put us in pain and to put us in discomfort to make us learn. As a, um, a, a follow-up kind of to yeah. that, regarding your experience in, in bugs and basic yes. water demolition and SEAL training, um, you started off with 200 um, yes. already elite, I, I would say, if, if, if you're going to undergo that training, you always have to be probably an athlete, uh, best of the best. Now, of that 200, only 20 graduated. Yes. Um, and in your book, you talk about certain attributes and characteristics um, of that group of your 19 brothers that graduated with you. Yes. Um, could, could you elaborate a little bit about what it, what it took to stay together um, through that grueling and rigorous training? Sure. 
Well, maybe I'll tell you uh, a little bit about my own hardest moment. Because I think everybody had a really, really difficult moment at some point in BUDS. And I think what I learned in my hardest moment was something that was learned universally. So, so my hardest moment in BUDS came during the pinnacle of the training. It came during a week that's called Hell Week. Um, and Hell Week is universally considered to be the hardest week of the hardest military training in the world. And in the course of Hell Week, the average class sleeps for a total of two to five hours over the course of the entire week. And during Hell Week, they have you doing physical training on the beach with logs that weigh several hundred pounds. And you're doing two mile ocean swims and four mile runs in soft sand on the beach. And you're running the apps course. Everybody is pushed past their physical, mental, and emotional limit. And, uh, for our class, we'd been going for about three days. We'd been up for 72 hours. And we got to a point where everyone was so exhausted that they would literally just fall asleep standing up and just fall over. And uh, finally, we were supposed to have what was going to be the greatest moment of Hell Week. And I was looking forward to it. It was the first time we were allowed to go and sleep. And what happened was we all had, the different crews had to do a dip contest on these bars outside. And Whichever crew won was able to run into the tent first to go to sleep. Well, my crew lost, and we ran into the tents last. And as we ran into the tents, as soon as we got in there, all of the other students were already passed out asleep. And I laid down, and with every beat of my heart, I could feel my right foot pulsing. Because the last time I'd been through medical, they'd wrapped my foot really tightly. So I got up, I took my boot off, I ripped the bandage off, threw it on the ground, tied the boot back up, laid back down, and still I couldn't fall asleep. And after a week of being freezing cold, there's now this beam of sunlight that's coming through the tent, and it's hitting my cot and the cots of a couple guys around me. It's now oppressively hot. <laughs> And I started to panic a little bit. And I started to think, you know, what's going to happen to me if I can't sleep? I only get two to five hours of sleep over the course this whole week. What's going to happen to me if I can't sleep? And I knew that I was actually going a little bit crazy at the time because the, the thought actually ran through my mind. I actually thought to myself, maybe, maybe if I can't sleep, maybe they'll, they'll let me take a nap. Right? <laughs> and, and, and so, so I, I'm there. And what, what started to happen was I started to get and then I started to feel a lot of self-pity. And I started to think, you know what? It's not fair that my team ran into the tent last. It's not fair that they wrapped my foot the wrong the last time I went to medical. It's not fair that I have the worst cotton. So I started to think, I started to get fearful and started to feel self-pity. And I got up and I walked out of the tent. And I went over to a faucet that was about shoulder height. And I put my head under the faucet and I washed the water over my head. And then just kind of clear my head. And then as I was walking back to the tent, um, I just said to myself, I said, it's not about me. I said, this test isn't about me. This test is about my ability to be of service to the people who were asleep in that tent. The minute that I took my focus off of myself, the minute that I stopped thinking about my own pain and my own self-pity, then I walked into the tent and I fell asleep right away. And and I knew then that I passed through my hardest moment. One of the things that I noticed in BUDS, and this was true generally, I'll say later I realized that that was the only time in all of Hell Week that I was alone. At every other moment as I was going through the training, I was a leader. I was in charge of my boat crew. I was in charge of my class. And so no matter how much pain I was in, no matter how much difficulty it was for me, I knew that whatever was happening, I had to take care of the people around me. And then when I allowed myself to start thinking about myself and my own pain and my own fear, that's when I started to get weaker. And what I noticed with all of these athletes who went through the training, and you're right, I mean, there were high school track stars, Division I college football players, international quality water polo players, like great athletes, but what would happen is everybody got pushed past the envelope of their talent. And what would start to happen is some people would focus on themselves then. And once they were in pain, they were happy to be helpful when they were feeling good. And they were happy to be helpful to others when they were in the front of the run. But as soon as they were in pain and they were in a moment of difficulty, then they started to collapse into themselves. And that's when they started to get weak. Um, there were a lot of moments in the training when we were running down the beach, I can remember carrying this log that weighed several hundred pounds, when I thought to myself, if I were alone right now, I don't think I'd make it. But there's somebody to my left who's counting on me, there's somebody to my right who's counting on me, and I believe that the reason that people made it through the training 
was that, and, and they come from all these different backgrounds, all these different you know ideas. Was that was that no matter what happened in their own moment of physical pain and difficulty and challenge, they were able to think about other people. And I think that was one of the essential traits that actually <coughs> kept people going and kept them through the train. Uh, the other thing I'll mention that I think was a trait that I was not expecting was that actually the people who made it through the training ended up having a pretty good sense of humor. <laughs> and I, I think you have to, because actually having a good sense of humor, first of all, it you know it helps you keep everything in perspective. Um, and you know it's a mechanism when things are when things are rough. And you know, it's so miserable that you've got to find a way to have fun. So, so you know, that was the other thing, was that people, a lot of the people who made it, not everybody, not universally, but a lot of people who made it through, they had a really good sense of humor. All right, this uh, time is flying right now. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask one more question. I'd like to bring it back to you. The mission continues. Yes. Um, and then we're going to turn it over the, to the audience. Uh, so think about some questions that you might have. Um, and then we'll, we'll go uh, and we'll give you the last five minutes uh, after audience questions to kind of wrap it up. Okay. Um, so there are, uh, there are a lot of different service organizations that are doing, you know, millions of hours of community service yes. uh, here in the States and abroad, you know, whether it's from the Mission Continues, the Sixth Branch, um, to international, like AmeriCorps, Peace Corps, you know, Peace Corps, yes. AmeriCorps domestically. Um, and all of them have a significant impact locally and yeah. regionally. Um, how do you, and, and this is, I mean, you, you're dedicating yourself to this now, so I, I, I know that you've got a good answer for this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Is, uh, <laughs> is, is some, some people, you know, uh, there, uh, sometimes there is uh, the criticism of an event like, you know, let's, let's go out and pick up trash, or let's go, let's go mentor, um, you know, third graders in the inner city on a yeah. Sunday morning. Um, and, and there is kind of the question about, all right, where, where do we take that? And we all look at that and say, that is, that is awesome, that is great, and that, you know, it feels good, and there's a whole lot of goodness going on there. How do you take that and make it into a, a bigger systemic change? And, and especially with the mission continues, I know you've, you know, there's there's a fellowship program with the Mission Continues where you are, you know, 100% uh, enabling veterans to come home and dedicate completely to service, yes. um, to make it, you know, on a timeline longer, on on scale and impact and significance. Yeah. How do you, how do you make that bigger? So, I'm, I'll just kind of walk through an answer. I'm not I'm not sure that I actually have this fully fully thought through, but. I remember actually when I went to work with, uh, I worked with Mother Teresa's Missionaries of Charity for a little bit in Varanasi, India, and then in, in Calcutta. And if any of you have been there or you know, they are often working uh, in these homes for the destitute and dying. And I was working primarily in this home in Varanasi, India, but then I went to the home Kaligat, which is one of the original homes in Calcutta. And when I was in Kaligat, I was there and I, I had an incredible experience. I got to see Mother Teresa. I had, it, was, it was a fantastic experience. But I also remember there was a moment where there were all of these um, volunteers who were stepping off of this bus who were coming into the home to work. And they were all washing blankets. They were, they were hand washing all of these blankets. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I know, I know for sure that there are donors who would buy some washing machines. Right? And I was thinking to myself, like, why are they doing this? This seems so inefficient. It just doesn't quite make sense to me that they'd have everybody out here washing these blankets because it'd be so much more efficient to throw them in the wash. Fewer people doing it. You get the blankets out cleaner. In my mind, you know, thinking about systems and efficiency, right? You're starting to think like, hey, this would be, make so much more sense to do it in these different ways. And I actually, I, and I left. And I left uh, India actually thinking that same way. And it was actually only later, when I looked back on the experience, that I realized that the home was there for the destitute and dying. But it was also a place where people were coming to actually transform themselves through service. And then actually, I mean, yes, the, the sisters had taken this vow of poverty, which was you know, technically the reason why they didn't have washing machines. But it was also, in practice, the fact was, all of these people now were able to come and have this experience of doing something with their hands that was actually valuable to uh, two people who needed a clean blanket. 
And I think that one of the things that we've learned that at the mission continues is that we're actually going to wounded and disabled veterans. And we're asking them to find a way to continue to serve. And we're saying to them, you know, there's, a, there's an organization here called Big Brothers Big Sisters, and we need you to become a big sister. And there's an organization here and, and a group of kids who needs a youth hockey coach, and a group of kids who's going to need a martial arts instructor. And there's Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and they need your service. And there might sometimes be more you know, efficient ways to do service projects, but actually what you want to do is actually provide that experience of serving others to people. And when our veterans come out, when we bring people together to do these service projects with veterans, what ends up happening is that people start a, an internal process of transformation. Right? And that through their actions, they might come for any number of different reasons, but through the act of actually being of service and through the act of being compassionate, through the act of being courageous, they actually start to become more compassionate, more courageous. And so I think that actually what you're doing with a lot of these service projects is that you're helping people to actually shape their character. Right? And for our veterans, when they go and they start this service work, Right? If we said to them, you need to do this for yourself because it's going to be good for you, they'd blow us off. They got plenty of people who are telling them uh, you know, what they need to do for themselves. But in fact, when we go to them and we say that you're needed here, then what happens is they respond to that call for service. And I think what we need to do as a country is to connect to people and let them know that they are needed. <coughs> because there are tremendous needs, and yet a lot of times we're just not asking. One of the things that we found when we did this survey of veterans is that they came back and they said that they felt like they didn't have something to offer, but no one was asking them to continue to serve in their community. So, you know, in the same way that, that the, in the home and for Mother Teresa, what they recognized was that by creating these opportunities for service, they were actually shaping the characters of the people who were serving. What we need to do is to go to everyone and find ways to ask them uh, to be of service. And if we can do that from a leadership perspective, then we actually create opportunities for them uh, to grow into their own strength. So, more of a process than a end, end goal. Yeah, and I think that what ends up happening is once people start to serve, once you start to build this habit of service, then you find that they actually become, uh, they become service oriented. The single largest indicator at, for whether or not uh, young people, or I'm sorry, the single largest indicator for whether or not um, post-college graduates are involved in community service is whether or not they did it as kids. And so, what, so it's like everything else. If you want to build this culture, you have to get people involved in these activities and build that habit. We're trying to do that for veterans who are coming back, who have all these abilities. We're trying to build those habits of post-military service in a civilian context. With that, uh, I think we'll turn it over to uh, audience questions. Um, and we've got a microphone here. Uh, you know, feel free to get up um, and go to the microphone. Uh, I think we're going to start off uh, with Nick here. Uh, who interned for the Mission Continues in 2010. Yes. So uh, on behalf of everyone, thank you very much for sharing your afternoon, your experiences, and insights with us. Pleasure. Um, so I'm Nick, and I, I, I'm in the Navy as well. Uh, and so my question to you is about talent retention in yeah. the military. Um, the mission continues and here at HKS I've been very impressed by the talents and commitment to service of many military veterans but what I find is many of them are getting out and so my question to you is uh, can you share a little bit more about your experience making that decision to leave active duty sure and um, and maybe what or a little insight on maybe what the military could do to better retain its best leaders yeah, yeah great question so for me uh, when I came back from that deployment in Iraq and I saw what was happening with, uh, with not just my friends, but with the Marines who I had visited at, at Bethesda Naval Hospital, um, I just knew that this was the place where I was needed. I felt like because of my military service, because of the work that I had done studying and working with international humanitarian organizations overseas, because there weren't other organizations in the space that were actually challenging veterans or just giving them 
things to them. Um, I knew that this was an important place for me, and, and I made the decision to stay in the reserves. Um, I'm still in the reserves and, and happy, to, happy to do that, but I knew that this was a place you know, for me uh, to continue to serve, and I don't know that it was any more um, any more complicated than just knowing that like the time had come in my life when this was the, this was the way for me to change my, my path in service. Um, I think that one of the things that we can do more generally in the US military is that right now we have kind of one train track uh, career path that you can be on and you can, you can kind of jump into the military and you can stay in and you can do your 20 plus years and then you can retire um, or you can jump in, you can do some time on active duty and then you can, can stay in the reserves as you, as you go, go forward. But we don't have a, a system that provides the kind of flexibility so that people can step out and, and really actually step outside of the military. We have a wonderful here, right, who's, who's actually here and is going to do this study at the Kennedy School and then is going to go back to West Point. But there come times in people's lives when they might have gotten married or they've had a couple of kids or they would decide that they want to start a business. And there, there's just a time for them when they want to step outside of that military life and pursue another track. And there's often not a way for them to step back into the military. In the same way, we often, uh, for incredibly talented people, who might be really capable leaders in the private sector, in journalism, in universities, there's often not a way for them to insert themselves into the military process other than going to boot camp or going to officer candidate school for us to kind of capture that talent. And I think that there's probably ways for the military to think more creatively about how you can actually capture some of that talent and then bring it in uh, to use it effectively. One of the best places where we do that in the military is actually in the medical service. Right? So a medical service, you have a lot of civilian docs who are absolutely fantastic, and they can do a, an immediate kind of cross-transfer in uh, to the US military, and, and they're able to use their talents and, and to serve there. Um, but outside of the medical service, we have trouble a lot of times taking really talented strategic planners, thoughtful people, cultural experts, and actually bringing them in in a way so that we can make use of their talents. And I think we could do a better job there. Thanks. You're welcome, Nick. Well, hey Cameron. Yes. 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 Yeah. Fantastic question, Cameron. I think. Um, oh, sure. Is that good? Is that good? Yeah. Uh, fantastic question. I think that for a, a lot of times when veterans come home, they are confronted by a society that has no appreciation for their experience. They don't really know uh, what they have lived through. And one of the things that I think we have to do is create, uh, create opportunities for better veterans in dialogue. We're actually, because everyone is curious, they want to know, you know, what was it, what was it like when you were serving in Afghanistan? What was it like when you were serving in Afghanistan? Sometimes it's just not the right time, it's not the right place for um, an individual to have that, that conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so you're we can, we can hear you fine. Yeah, all right, great. So, so I think one of the things that we have to do is create those opportunities for actual outreach to families and to friends that, so that when uh, you know, people come home, there's a place for families and for friends to go to hear about the experience in general. You might not need to turn to a particular person and ask them about their experience the minute that they stepped off of the plane, right? Which is what happens to, to a lot of people. And you're, you're still trying to think about how to, how to process that. The other thing that I think can be helpful is that a lot of times people who are really caring and know that veterans have lived through great hardship, they want to come to them and they want to baby them, right? And they want to do this because they're, they're they're thoughtful and they're caring and they want to take care of people when they come home. 
but especially for people who have suffered, and they might have suffered physically or they might have suffered post-traumatic stress disorder, a lot of times actually that outreach, whether it's giving people gift baskets or blankets or free movie tickets or free rent rental cars, it actually feels to the veteran like you think I'm a charity case. Like I came home and now I'm hurt and now all I'm good for is and I'm giving these things. I think that as veterans, our responsibility in this is to find ways, and this is obviously what we do at the Michigan, find ways to come back and show people how that military service is a value back at home. And that might be going out and becoming a youth soccer coach. That might be coming out and getting involved in education and being able to take some of that experience that you've had and mm -hmm. show people how you can use it in order to be of service back here at home. And I think that sets the right message, right? And the veteran is saying, I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna use this experience to serve, and if we can reach out to civilians more generally, family and friends, when we first come home, tell them about that experience and give them some guidance on how to actually speak, the veterans, I think that can, be, that can go a long way. We've got about eight minutes, so sure. we could uh, we'd like to get some more questions from the audience. Uh, eight minutes until you close up, and we'll try to get those over for you. Yeah, for sure. Get some more questions. Yeah. Sure. Hi, Eric. Uh, my name is Dan. I'm um, an Army vet. Uh, I'm a fan here as well. <laughs> and uh, like Dan, I saw uh, my graduate school experience after leaving the military, after yes. separating from the military. Yeah. And your experience was one that has always struck me as very unique, and it's, it's very much the opposite. So I'm wondering if you have um, certainly had time to reflect, but what reflections you've had on how your graduate school experience influenced your military experience, and if it's something that you could see yourself still having done without having gone to grad school, or if it enriched it, took away from it, or uh, what you took away from that. Sure. Well, the first thing I'll say is that my, my other good friend here is a, a Navy veteran, his name, Dan. So I don't know what you guys have going on with like the, the Dan. But, but, but anyway, um, you know, so a, a couple of things. First of all, uh, in my own experience, one of the things that happened was by the time I joined the military, I was 26. And uh, it doesn't sound for all of us who are in this room like you're that old, but actually to a kid who's 19 when you're 26, I mean, you may as well be their dad. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge, a huge gulf there. And so I, I actually you know, joined a little bit older. And one of the things that that actually did for me also was that I had, I had a little more life experience. I had a little more maturity. You know when you're 26 years old that nothing that's painful lasts forever, right? And you know when you're 26 years old that if you just kind of keep focused on doing the right things, you might work through some pain, but everything's not a crisis when you're 20. In the way that it is when you're 19, 20, and this is the first major thing that you've ever really been tested with in your life. So, so that was helpful to me. And then the other thing was that I think I benefited tremendously from the perspectives that I gained in graduate school, both in the classroom um, and in the classroom with what I learned academically and with the people who I was with. I was with a wonderful international cadre of students, and they taught me a lot in the classroom. And then the experience that I had doing service work overseas really informed the way that I ended up approaching my deployments so that when I was in a place like Kenya, for example, I wasn't thinking about it just as a military officer. I'd actually been there before as a student, and I was thinking and doing service work, and it lent a much different and helpful perspective uh, when I was a military officer. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Eric. Thanks for your time. Well, um, I think you make a, a really compelling case for a continuance of service and having a, a challenging best to do that. I think a, a lot of vets though are also concerned about work and employment yes. and jobs yes. and, and, and home. Some of them obviously homelessness rates among veterans is, yes. is, uh, is far beyond the national proportions. So I wonder, in addition to getting them involved in their communities, uh, what thoughts you have on getting the jobs and getting them back to work? Yeah, absolutely. So for us, a successful fellowship is one where the fellow leaves and they go on to full-time employment, uh, full-time education, some combination of the two, and what we call an ongoing role in service. So they're continuing to serve in their community. They're not just getting a job, but they're continuing to serve. That's success for us. And we actually think of, the fellowship is only seven months, we think of the fellowship as a springboard back into your life as a citizen leader. And we've actually had tremendous success with our fellows going through this project. And what happens is when they serve, they reconnect to their sense of purpose. 
when they begin to serve again, they see that they do have a value in the civilian context, and they decide, you know what, I want to become a licensed physical therapist. I want to become a pediatric nurse. I want to start my own business. I want to, right? And so it's that period in service where it actually opens up these prospects. But you're exactly right. For us, the success there is not for them to be a mission continues fellow for the rest of their life. The success is for them to actually become a citizen leader fully employed, fully capable, who's actually at work again in the world. And I think that, again, for a lot of veterans, you're exactly right, there's this concern about the house, and there's a concern about what's right in front of them with the job, and there's this concern about what's happening with their family. There are all these concerns that are right in front of them, and when you're hit by, and this is just a general rule that's true about life, when you're hit by all of these different obstacles at once, it just it can really wear you down. When you have a direction and you're working through those obstacles, then you actually, that's how resilience builds, right? Is when you actually have a purpose and you have a direction. What we're doing at the Mission Continues is we're not taking away all of those obstacles, but we're providing a sense of direction through them and a path to success through them. And our fellows are able to see that the fellows before them, you know, somebody who lost their eyesight sees somebody else who lost their eyesight who's now fully employed. And they see somebody else who came back with post-traumatic stress disorder who's now going back to school. And they see these models, they see a direction for themselves through that so that they do get to a place where they are fully employed and they're able to deal with those, all of those obstacles which are going to continue to come. Yeah, please. Thank you again for sharing. You're welcome. I'd like to know what were your experiences when you made transitions? Because uh, you have quite a varied experience and sometimes if you become a humanitarian, and uh, in, I mean, it's, it's a type of difficulty to be a soldier, but sometimes if you're a humanitarian, the, the armed people, when they come to you, don't have a gun. So you have to use a different set of skills. You may have the character and qualities, but you don't have the skills. So what were your experiences in the beginning of these, of these transitions? And I'm asking this because many people here who are very successful, thinking to make radical transitions. And the beginning for them is maybe the most challenging part. If they start, probably they will be as successful. But what was that, that, uh, that defining moment when you yes. have to build immediately? Yes. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, and, and I think, actually, I mean, that's a great, great question for, for us all to talk. Because I, I, first, let me start with a really general thought. I would say. Generally speaking, and I don't, I don't know each one of you personally. I know many of you who are in this room, but I don't know each one of you personally. But I would say that for the people who are at this place, who are in this room right now, if you think about what the greatest risk is to you of making this transition from success to significance, I would suggest that the greatest, you know, uh, the greatest risk is that you won't take the risk. The greatest risk is that you won't take the risk because you've built up what ends up happening to a lot of people is they get successful in a particular field. They get successful in a particular place. And then that can be very comforting and you feel solid and you feel successful in that particular environment and you don't want to step outside of it. Um, I was you know, fortunate in all of my transitions uh, to recognize that I was not going to meet with success. And I think it, so all of those transitions were difficult transitions. You know, when I first joined the US military, I went from being at, being at Oxford, I was doing my, uh, my dissertation defense. They call it a VIVA. And then the VIVA, you know, there's the Oxford for dons, and they actually do wear these you know, black gowns with the little bow ties. And, and um, you know, the question that I was asked, one of the questions I was asked in my defense was, you know, Mr. Groyton, what, what is your theory of ideas, right? And they wanted to know my theory of ideas and what I thought about. And then I got to the US military, and I had a drill instructor who was standing over me, who was yelling at me, saying, you don't even know how to tie your shoes. How are you going to be able to write? Because I tied my shoes the wrong way. I didn't tie them in the Navy way that I was supposed to tie them. And, and there is there's this sense like, wow, I just left this place where I was really successful. And I could have kept doing all these things. And now I'm in this place where people don't even think that I can tie my shoes. <laughs> and, and, and in the same way, you know, when I think about my life, other transitions, when I came back from Iraq, you know, I was a successful Navy SEAL, and I was doing well there. And then I had this idea 
that I wanted to start this thing called The Mission Continues. And actually, I, I, I didn't even know it was going to be called The Mission Continues. And I had a really bad idea that I called the Center for Citizen Leadership, which is a terrible name. Because right? I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't citizen-centered something. It just, it didn't work. Um, but, 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 um, but what ended up happening, you know, when I came back was, you know, I, I was I was living on an air mattress at home with an idea that I wanted to get this organization off the ground. And everybody who I went to to ask for help told me about what other people were doing. And nobody wanted to give me funding. I didn't have a website. I didn't have a program. I didn't have a plan. But what I decided I would do right at the beginning was that I would focus on changing just one life. And I knew that if I could change just one life in our program, that other people would see the value of it and they would start to come together. Um, all of that, you know, I just offer as, as an example in my life, those transitions were hard. And it's easy to look back now, and the mission continues as a successful, growing, dynamic nonprofit organization. There were months where I really doubted whether or not this thing was actually going to get off the ground. And so I think that the danger for all of us who are in a place like this is that you won't take uh, take the risk. Um, I, I got some really good advice uh, when I was when I was young, and somebody said it's really important when you design your life that you always have a place in your life where you're a beginner at something. Um, for me right now, it's it's doing taekwondo. So it's a martial art that I started, and I just think that it's actually it's really valuable for me to go every single day to a place where I don't know what I'm doing. And I have to learn from a master, and I have to learn from an instructor. And it just it gives you the confidence to be able to start new things and to make those transitions. And what I would encourage all of you to do, if, if, you know, if, I, if I can give unsolicited advice at, at this point, I mean, the thing that, that's actually worked for me has been taking those, taking those sensible, thoughtful risks. Because um, at the end of the day, every single person who's in this room is going to be fine. You really are going to be fine. And you might doubt yourself for a while, and you might not feel like you're quite as successful as your friends, right? But if you actually take that risk and you invest in yourself and you're willing to bet on yourself, um, I think that's the best thing that you can possibly do. I think uh, that is an awesome point to close out. <laughs> so I'd like to please join me. Uh, thank you, Eric. Welcome.